Thanks everybody for coming. This is the Talks at Google series. Uh, we are very, very lucky to have with us today Francis Stroh, the author of Beer Money, a memoir of privilege and loss. And uh, we thought we would kick it off with having Francis do a reading from the book. Francis, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Bill. It's a great pleasure to be here. I obviously wrote a book about what it was like growing up in the Stroh family, a big brewing family in Detroit, beginning in 1850. And I thought maybe I would just talk a little bit about the trajectory of the business before I Please. settle into Absolutely. a reading, yeah, yeah, yeah. because um, it'll just give a little bit of context to what I'm going to read, which is actually a personal family-oriented passage. Um, so my great-great-grandfather, Bernard Stroh, came over from Germany in 1848 with a family recipe, a uh, beer recipe. His family had made beer in Germany and $150 in his pocket. And he settled in Detroit in 1850. And he started brewing beer in his basement. And he sold it door to door out of a wheelbarrow. And he saved every spare penny to buy a horse-drawn carriage. He took the company through prohibition with his sons, Julius and Bernard Jr. Um, they really took over at that point and uh, took the company through prohibition by selling malt syrup for home brewing purposes. This was legal during prohibition. Nice loophole. As, yeah. Yes, yeah. it was a great loophole for many. And also Stroh's ice cream they started producing during Prohibition, which helped the family get through. Julius, my great-grandfather, bought out his brother's share of the company during the Prohibition years. He was a really smart guy. He bought the shares for almost nothing. And then uh, the company went gangbusters when Prohibition was repealed um, under Julius's continued reign. And then my grandfather, Gary Stroh, took over the business just before World War II. And um, there was a very stubborn streak in the Stroh family, which is one of the reasons the company survived in the family for five generations. And this really presented itself in Gary's case when uh, hops and wheat were rationed during the war, and Gary refused to water down the beer formula to keep volumes up as every other US brewer did, and really just sold less beer, but stuck to his guns and kept the strong beer taste. Ironically, after the war ended, American beer tastes had changed, um, and American consumers had really sort of gravitated at that point towards the wa more watery beer, which is why Europeans make fun of us for having watery beer, which of course is changing now with the craft brew industry. But um, in those days, people wanted the watery taste. When my great uncle John took over the company after Gary died, he watered down the beer. Again, the company went up exponentially. They bought Goebel, they bought other brewers in the Detroit area. And then my Uncle Peter Stroh took the company over in the late 70s and decided to grow through major acquisition rather than small acquisition and sort of incrementally as we had done. We were regional Midwestern brewers still in the late 70s. And uh, what Peter decided to do was purchase much larger companies than, than Stroh's. He purchased Schlitz. He purchased Schaefer in the early 80s. We were 100 million market cap. Schlitz was five times our size. We took out a half a billion dollar loan to buy it. And suddenly, we were a big national powerhouse. But we were still family owned and operated. We were number three in size behind Anheuser-Busch and Miller. And we, people ask all the time, what went wrong? Well, our company culture was still family owned and operated, family run board, still sort of a regional brewing mentality. And overnight, we were national. We had breweries all over the country. And we didn't have the marketing budget to go that big that quickly. So um, a variety of other factors impacted 
our success between um, 1982 and 1991 when we were Forbes 400 and suddenly went from being huge and seemingly successful to almost broke in about 10 years. Um, so that's really the sort of thumbnail sketch of what happened. My book is about what it was like growing up in the Stroh family during those years in the 70s, 80s, and 90s when the company went really big and then lost everything and sold for scraps to Paps in the late 90s. It's my coming of age story as an artist, as someone who's sort of reflecting the family story in a variety of ways um, in my work. And, um, and it ties in the story, the fallout on the family and my branch of the Stroh family, what was happening to the family members as, um, as this beer story was unfolding. So that will bring me to um, this passage, which takes place in Gross Point in 1980. I was 13 years old at the time. The December light faded so suddenly I could hardly read my own words. Rather than switch on the chandelier, I slid my high school application essay across the dining table closer to the bay window. Snow was beginning to fall. The empty house creaked around me as I bore down on my paragraphs, determined to get down exactly how things had felt the summer before when everything changed, it seemed, overnight. I wrote about my parents' faces, pale and swollen with sleeplessness, and the knotted feeling inside my stomach. Something terrible was happening. My mother had given up playing backgammon. My father had stopped leaving for work. I described the hushed voices, the closed doors, my gnawing sense that everything would come apart at any moment, that only a barely discernible tensing of all my muscles might hold it together. My parents sealed themselves in the library for days. Whatever you do, my father said as he pulled the door behind him, do not come in here. Whitney and I sat on the porch watching TV, our blank faces masking our alarm, buoyed at least partly by the Brady Bunch, bewitched, happy days. My younger brother's auburn hair was oddly disheveled, his trousers an inch too short. How I envied my older brothers, both of them off of college, Charlie a sophomore and Bobby a senior. On day three, my parents emerged, drained, older, yet united in their conviction that we should know the truth. It's so awful to have to tell you this, my mother began in a cracked voice, the puffed wedges underneath her eyes by now a deep purple. But it's important you know, your brother Charlie is a drug dealer. Her eyes filled up with tears and she looked away. My father dragged on his cigarette dismissively. We're taking him out of college, putting him into the Marines to clean him up. As my mother wept, my father put his cigarette into the ashtray and gently rested both his hands on her shoulders. I couldn't remember the last time I'd seen them touch. You must never mention a word about this to anyone outside the family, my mother said to Whitney and me with unusual sternness wiping her cheeks with the back of her hand. Nobody at all. I felt the news and accompanying emotions seal themselves off inside my body with the ease of a closing elevator door. Drug dealers were something you saw on TV, not in my own family. I remembered an episode of Starsky and Hutch where the drug dealer lived in an abandoned apartment on the outskirts of town. Starsky kicked in the door while Hutch aimed the gun. I turned on the chandelier so that I could reread my essay. Outside, the snow was falling harder now and a few stray sparrows pecked aimlessly at the frozen ground. My last winter in Michigan. 
Next year, I'd be gone, away at boarding school for ninth grade and away from this house. I've been waiting to go since sixth grade, counting down the years impatiently. The applications all asked for an essay on an experience that had changed my life. And so while other eighth graders wrote about their golden retrievers dying, I wrote about Charlie's drug bust and what it had done to our family. The shame and silence spreading from my parents to us and then into just about every aspect of our lives. Charlie had been selling cocaine, a drug I knew about from Time magazine. I'd seen pictures of it, lines of white powder on the cover. My parents had heard the news from Charlie's college dean earlier that year in the spring. He was expelled and under pressure from my parents, immediately enrolled in Marine boot camp in San Diego, leaving in early June. But as June passed into July, everything kept changing and the tension in the house got only worse. So at the end of the summer, my parents go out to San Diego for Charlie's boot camp graduation. On the day of the ceremony, as I heard later, my parents waited in the auditorium, holding their programs, eager to see Charlie graduate into his new life, desperate to put the whole ordeal behind them. But when the Marines finally filed in, clean and spiffed up in their blue uniforms and broad brim Marine hats, my parents noticed that Charlie was not among them. Confused, my father walked up the aisle to look into the hallway. There was Charlie, stiff with fear in his uniform, handcuffed and surrounded by several federal agents. My father went back into the auditorium and took my mother out by the arm. Charlie was, was gone. Done for, they drove back to La Jolla, my mother in tears, my father shocked and humiliated. Both of them determined to conceal from their hosts what had happened. Their worst nightmare was unfolding. Charlie's drug dealing would surely make it into the papers now, especially if he ended up in prison. Everyone in Gross Point would know. Everyone, everywhere. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you. That's, uh, that's some powerful stuff. Thank uh, you. So uh, something, something that stuck out to me, um, you know, your father coming out and saying, you know, tell, tell no one, right? I mean, for obvious reasons, it could bring, you know, embarrassment and, you know, it's, it's understandable. Um, so natural next question. You, you wrote a book. Uh, you wrote a book all about it. Um, and I know, I know your, your father's no longer with us, mm -hmm. but your mother's still uh, with us and, and several other family members, right? Um, so what has been the, the reaction from, from your, your family? Well, my Charlie's no longer with us. My father's right. no longer with us. Um, my mother has been an incredible support. She's really had my back from the beginning and, you know, handed galleys out to her friends, read the book out loud to a friend of hers who's lost her sight. She comes to as many of my events as she can. So nice. she's been amazing. And awesome. oh, I, I would say overall, it's been positive, the relatives who I've heard from. Sure. The book really focuses on my branch of the Stro family. Um, although it ties in, of course, the trajectory of the business and what happened and, and how that was tied to Detroit's destiny and sort of the decimation of Detroit mm -hmm. and some of the losses the family experienced financially was connected with that. Um, so it's all connected and, uh, and yet the beauty of the timing of when the story ends, the story ends in 2009 and by the time the book was being published, Detroit's renaissance was in, you know, the throes of its heights. I mean, it, yeah. we, it's really come together tremendously in Detroit during the time that the book was sort of in the works with a publisher. And so it's been an exciting period to sort of come bring the book forward at this mm -hmm. time. And also with Pabst relaunching Stroh's Beer in Detroit and, you know, everything that has sort of, um, 
really coalesced there. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, uh, it's almost like a nice, uh, nice way to kind of look back on what, where we came from uh, as, a, as a city in a, you know, southeastern Michigan uh, as a whole. Um, so, I mean, so on that, right, I mean, it, it, near the end of the book, um, there is a little talk of, you know, kind of the decline of Detroit. Um, and you, you kind of said it, but I mean, there is, there's, there's some kernels of hope at the end. And I think that that has really kind of been the, the harbinger in a great way of, of all the great things that are happening. That's right. Um, yeah, I mentioned the Museum yeah. of Contemporary Art Detroit, the new wing at the DIA, the fact that the artists are moving in and, and really, it's always, when the artists come in, we know that the city's coming back because then, you know, yeah. the, the buzz starts to happen, the restaurants come in, the cafes, the galleries everything the artists are always sort of the canaries in the coal mine yes so um and of course that was inspiring to me and and as you know in that last scene in the book my my we've just left my father's funeral we're driving downtown uh we're watching you know seeing the places where the houses are being knocked down where there are holes in neighborhoods uh, the, the vegetables and the gardens are being planted yeah. to make up for the fact that there were no grocery chains in 2009. Right. And of course, that's all changed dramatically, but this feeling of rebirth and hope and resilience that really has been such a hallmark of how I have lived my life mm -hmm. and wanted to, and you know, as I carved out my own identity, sort of separate from the Stroh family story, but then return to it later in life, sure. as I have to write the book and sort of reclaim that history in my own way. Yeah. Uh, so Detroit, I think, has done that in its own sense as well, and it's a, it's been an amazing thing to watch. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's exciting for those of us that are that are yeah here living it. Um, so with that happening, I mean the the timing right is serendipitous of you writing the book, is that what spurred you to, to write the book or was there other factors that, that drove you to, it's like, why now, right? Why tell your story now? Well, it wasn't necessarily related to what was going on in Detroit at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I started the book, nobody was talking about Detroit. It was right, probably, it was pre-bankruptcy. Yeah, That's or if they when were, it wasn't positive. National, yeah. atten national yeah. attention yeah. started to sort of really focus itself on Detroit around the time of the bankruptcy. I was writing the book because it was a story I felt I'd always known I wanted to write. And somehow uh, when my father died, the, it opened the door to do that. There was just, I'd been working on a novel for several years. Prior to that, I'd been an installation artist mm -hmm. and um, all through my 20s, in fact. And because my work was so narrative based as an installation artist, um, in fact, I had done um, the only piece I ever did during those years um, that involved th family themes was a piece that I describe in the prologue to the book where um, in a gallery space, in a room inside a gallery, there's a piece that I made with all six of my family members telling the family story from each of their dis very disparate points of view. Um, all at the same time on six video, flat screen video monitors, and it's this very explosive experience in the center of the room with all of these voices overlapping. And, um, and that really uh, was one of the seeds for this mm -hmm. book that came later. Um, and perhaps even looking back on the writing of the high school application essay, the seeds for sure. the book were of course present there too. So there's been uh, a creative impulse for a long time, um, not just to tell my family's story and come to terms with it, uh, but just to sort of penetrate the truth and really sort of bring things to light and under understand things on a deeper level and create meaning out of events. Right. Right, and so uh, I, I, I wouldn't put this on you necessarily, I'll let you tell me. Uh, this has been a pretty cathartic experience for you writing the book? I think that has been uh, one of the side effects that yeah. has been wonderful. It was never the intention, but I did find 
through the writing of the book that I was able to make connections between mm -hmm. events that I'd never made before. And I, the book is the story is told in a very episodic way, yeah. where um, each chapter is essentially a snapshot either of a period in my own life or in the families or both. I mean, I'm the narrator. I'm always present for these events in the story. And, um, and so figuring out what events were very emblematic mm -hmm. of the overall story, because of course, the part stands in for the whole in a book like this, sure. um, was an interesting process, sort of. When I think about that drive down into Detroit as a teenager with friends, and we go and walk around the abandoned Unaroyal Tire plant, um, which, of course, is something that Detroiters, I guess, have always done. Yeah, it's a little continue, bit of a rite of passage. Continue for, uh, to do, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah, these, uh, these old warehouses and old factories are places that kids still love to explore. So yeah. we were doing that back in the mid 80s. And um, and so that that drive down to Detroit, the experience of going in, breaking into this enormous almost city within a city, the abandoned Unaroyal tire plant, um, and taking pictures. We're all artists. We're all sort of reading the same books. And then we go back to Gross Point and like re-enter the fold of our family's worlds, yeah. which were so, so different. I mean, the contrast from Detroit, Gross Point, you know, being with friends, being with family, all of that, especially in my world, it was sort of as if Detroit was this escape that I really needed. I needed, you know, my father had been an astonishingly talented photographer. I sort of carried that torch forward in high school and beyond. And uh, my father had gone in the family business instead of pursuing his dream of being a photographer. And a lot of Stroh family members, I feel, were pressured. The men were pressured to join the business, didn't follow their dreams, didn't necessarily play things out and carve out their own identities in the ways that perhaps they would have liked to. Sure. And, um, and I see this as one of the pitfalls of family businesses in general, but certainly in my own family, things unfolded, I think, per, you know, in a particular way because there were people working at the company, people running the company who may not have really wanted to be there, who would have preferred doing other things. That's interesting. So, yeah. so I, have, uh, I have two questions on that. So the first being, and, and you kind of touched on it, I mean, hindsight being, what it is, uh, what do you think the Stroh family could have done differently uh, to have kept in business? I mean, you touched on it a little bit, but I would love to get your thoughts on that. Sure. I feel that during the 80s, certainly when we went national, it yep. was a big, it was my Uncle Peter essentially decided to bet the farm. Yeah. Um, it was his feeling that we either had to grow, quote unquote, grow or go. And that may have been true. Um, but growing that quickly and um, without the marketing budget to take mm -hmm. those brands national and um, and a, really this ethos of wanting the fam wanting it to continue to be family owned and operated to have this company there so that their sons could inherit it. Um, it was the attachment, it was the over-identification with the brand that was the problem. We got a million dollar offer in the early 80s for the company, which the family run board turned down. Did I say million? I mean yeah. billion. Yeah. I was like, you know, Francis, it's probably good they turned that down. Uh, no. A no. billion dollar billion offer, dollars. which yeah. back then was right? 12 billion, you know, in today's dollars Easy. if invested, you know, yeah. in the S&P. So. Oh um, so turned it down, yeah. and I think the over-identification certainly was present then and continued to be as, um, as we fought to survive for the next 10 years because almost as soon as that offer was turned down, it, um, things got pretty hairy in the beer business um, with yeah. price wars and shrinking margins and, and all kinds of other stuff. So I really feel that if they wanted to stay in the business, it would have been better. Like Bill Ford, he knew when to step down, bringing in you know outside management. Yep. We really didn't find the right moment to sort of 
step aside and decide that we'd be better off if somebody else was running it and not a family member. Interesting. And so uh, the, the other question that you spurred for me was, uh, so you had the males in the Stroh family being encouraged, despite whatever their other interests may be, to go into the business. But it seems like from your book and things I've heard you say, there wasn't much of, of a path for the women. No, the patriarchal lines of succession were fixed. That was how things were done. And they, I feel as if, you know, maybe it's more so in German families than in others. I just read about a brewer in, in um, Germany. They've been around for nine generations, and they just put the first female family member on the board. So uh, this is very, very common in family-run businesses. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's starting to change. But uh, no, the women in the Stroh family were not encouraged to join the business. Interesting. Well, maybe that would have, maybe that would have made the difference. Who knows? Perhaps. Yeah. Um, so uh, a lot of the the book, just uh, pivoting off the business for a second, I want to I want to talk about um, uh, entitlement, right? Uh, that's especially pertinent to I think sometimes like at Google we forget how lucky we are sometimes. Uh, we're, we're very, very lucky um, to, to work in a place like this. Um, in your book, you talk about a lot of the family members re receiving their, um, their dividend checks, mm -hmm. right, that were just coming. And kind of the expectation was that it would always, always come. Um, you seem to have kind of been able to get away from, from that entitlement. And it's, it's clear you've instilled that in your son, Mishka. How, how have you kind of kept your head about that and, and been able to kind of rise above the apathy and entitlement? Well, I think my mother was extremely helpful when we were young. Um, well, to begin with, my father was a big spender. He liked to live extravagantly. He was mm -hmm. a big collector of art and various objects, um, antique firearms, vintage Leica cameras, guitars. And my mother was very frugal and very careful with money. Her motto was always save for a rainy day. And she really conditioned us to understand that uh, while she couldn't have known what direction the company was sure. headed in, she certainly saw that my father wasn't saving and that the future may have not been so bright. And she made us sort of integrate this into the very fabric of our outlook yeah. on life. So there was a feeling of potential scarcity, and at times real scarcity, when she had to call our schools and let them know the tuition would arrive late, or maybe even the phone bill couldn't be paid because of my father's extravagances. Wow. And uh, so there was this feeling of great abundance in terms of what we were surrounded with, and yet Sometime, and then you know there were these kidnapping drills where my father would take me out on the sidewalk in front of the house and train me as a young child to learn how to not be kidnapped. Um, he would circle the car around the block while I waited alone, terrified on the sidewalk, and he would pull up next to me and dangle a chocolate bar out the window and say, you know, in a scary voice, come here, little girl. And I would run back into the house crying, as I'd been instructed to do. And the reason for these drills, as he said, was we couldn't afford to pay the ransom. Uh, so there are very mixed messages around money. Yeah. And, uh, and so I feel as if I internalized all of that. And um, as I got older, of course, there was this drive to, I was just naturally an artist. I always was, for, as a young child, mm -hmm. drawing, as a teenager, a photographer. And, 20s installation artist, later became a writer, but so wanted to pursue that path and, um, and yet always knew that I somehow had to figure out the financial side sure. on my own. Yeah. And especially when my parents divorced and within several years my father remarried and married my high school classmate, in fact, um, the message was very clear then that I had to, I, I was very clear that I had to figure it out on my own financially. Yeah. And, and so taught myself finance and real estate and 
I was lucky. I w my timing was good. Mm -hmm. I was living in the Bay Area. Um, the real estate's done very well there, and yeah. so yeah. I, I was able very to well. sure. create yeah. a s nest egg that supports me to continue to be a writer and an artist, which has been very lucky. Very cool. And so, what um, you mentioned, you've gone through a couple iterations as as an artist, as um, you know, the installment artist and um, a writer. Is it what what's next for you? I mean, is it's it is writing? Is there more books? Can well, we I identify that? as a writer now. So okay, yes, I'm, I'm working a on a novel. Yeah. And um, oh, really? Yes. Can so can you? I'm not. I'm any? not saying a lot about it, but it's, it's definitely it's early stages. Okay. And uh, it's an exciting project. Very cool. Very cool. So what like what are we thinking? Like a year? When can we when can we keep an eye out for it? Uh, oh, probably more than that. Okay. Yes. Okay. I, it took me about four years to write beer money. So really, all yeah, right. I like to do draft after draft to really get the language exactly yes. where I want it. I, perfectionist. I am. Very, very good. Uh, what and, and you talk a lot about Detroit. Now you've you've transplanted yourself to to San Francisco. Uh, any any plans to uh, take that that real estate uh, prowess and, and and bring it to the bring it to the D? Uh, that's a great question. Yeah. I've been thinking about different options, and I would love to. Good. Uh, it's a great time to to invest in Detroit, and I can't say enough about all of the exciting things happening here. So I I actually encourage the world to come experience Detroit in one way or another. Yes. Um, it's just so exciting to see how um, the financial base is so diverse now compared to what it was when it was really run by, you know, the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the city suffered so dramatically when they moved out. Yeah. And, um, and of, you know, the industry is still here, but a lot of other industries are moving in as well, like Google and like so many other tech companies. and. And um, so I feel as if it's a more sustainable yeah. economic yes. space. I would completely agree yeah. with you. Which is exciting. Very exciting. Yes. Well, we would we would love to, to have you. Uh, we'd love to have your, your investment in the city, but we'd love to, to see more of, of Francis Stroh uh, around Thank Detroit. You. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, okay. So, so final question. A lot about the book, right, is about the business and about the family and, and how those two things intertwined. Um, any, it, it's certainly, uh, I read it almost as a little bit of a cautionary tale. Um, do you see any similarities between that situation and like the Silicon Valley, kind of these like inflated values and, and all these different things? Is there any, anything we as, as folks working at Google or working at Facebook or working at, uh, you know, any of the LinkedIn, wherever, any, any uh, words of advice, anything to be careful of? Well, I would see more of a parallel between Detroit and the auto industry and you know what Detroit was at that time mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. I see that parallel um, because it's, it's really, you know, it's an industry that defines an area. Um, in a way that, you know, Detroit was defined by the auto industry, Silicon Valley is defined by tech. That isn't necessarily the case in a lot of other American cities or, you know, areas of the country. Um, the parallel, I would find more of a parallel between my family's business and other family businesses. But this sense of hubris kind of crosses all those barriers. And I feel as if, that is something that we all need to be very, very vigilant about because the bubble mentality mm -hmm. um, is incredibly contagious and um, we lose perspective very easily. Yeah. And suddenly things have changed and we didn't even know the change was coming. So um, appreciating what we have and, and the perseverance that you know, the founder's values, I think of Bernard's values. Yeah. Um, if that could be carried on through each successive generation, somehow, I work with, now I consult with family businesses mm -hmm. about how to get the younger generation out into the world after college and build some grit and not 
you know, have their parents hand them jobs or call up their friends to give them a job for a year before they come back and work at the family business, which is how <laughs> it worked in my family. Yeah. Um, send them out with, you know, a small amount of money to get started and make them figure it out on their own for 10 years. It's only when we figure out who we are in the world, we follow a passion or two or three, carve out an identity, only then might we have something to offer our family's business or any mm -hmm. other business for mm -hmm. that matter. So that's my advice for families and everybody else yeah. in business. Thank you so, so much, Francis, for, uh, for coming here from, from San Francisco through Detroit now to, to Ann Arbor to talk with us. Um, so yeah, we, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for Thank the time. You. This it's has been pleasure. amazing. Very, very great.